Welcome to lecture 13, trusses, the method of joints, and zero force members. In this lecture, we'll have an introduction to trusses. We will define what a simple truss is. We will look at the method of joints, which is one of two methods which we will be using to analyze simple trusses. And we will discuss zero force members. Before we develop a formal definition of trusses, and in particular, uh, simple trusses, I think that we all have some idea of what a truss is. So let's look at uh, where we see trusses used. Certainly in the uh, residential and commercial building, you see uh, building industry, you see um, trusses uh, either made out of wood or metal used for uh, uh, roof structures and floor structures, um, bridges, um, uh, no shortage of truss use in bridges, and we're probably all familiar with that. Uh, large support structures, towers, uh, we all see the towers that carry the uh, high voltage lines from uh, our power plants to distribution points and you know large cranes and uh, uh, mechanisms certainly um, make use of trusses. I think we can safely say that the truss is one of the major types of engineering structures. Our work with trusses will be limited to determining the forces in a specific trusses members, given that trusses geometry and the loading placed upon it. The larger challenge with trusses, um, as with other uh, engineering uh, designs, is that the, uh, a specific truss uh, satisfies the load safety cost requirements um, and at the same time be lightweight, easy to manufacture, uh, easy to inspect, and easy to maintain over their lifetime. Now let's look at simple trusses. Uh, in general, a truss is composed of slender members joined together at their endpoints and if a specific truss along with the load imposed upon it lies in a single plane, then we call that a planar truss. A simple truss is a planar truss which begins with a triangular element made up of three members, which can be expanded by adding two members and a joint. And for simple trusses, the number of members and the number of joints are related by the equation shown here. The number of members equals two times the number of joints minus three. We have two major assumptions which underlie our simple truss analyses. The first is that all the loads applied to the truss will be applied at joints. In other words, we'll be loading the trusses by applying point loads at the joints. We won't have see any problems in this course where we have distributed loading um, on the truss, which is actually more realistic. And we're also going to neglect the weight of the truss members in our analyses as they are as the weight of a truss member is usually very small compared with the forces uh, that the truss is exposed to and that the members are supporting. The second assumption is that the members are joined together by smooth pins. So these the, at each joint, uh, whether it's two, three, four, or more uh, truss members uh, uh, being joined uh, at that joint, we assume that uh, that joint is accomplished uh, with a smooth pin passing through the ends of the truss members present at that joint. 
given the two assumptions that were discussed on a previous slide, all of the trust members in simple trusses, the, the type that we're going to be analyzing, will act as two force members. Now that term two force member should be familiar. We uh, introduced that a couple lectures ago when we talked about uh, equilibrium in 2D. And each of these uh, members, which act as a two force member, will either be loaded in tension or compression. So let's look at a member that's loaded in tension. It's a two force member. We're neglecting the weight um, as stated on the previous slide. And a two force member has uh, equal and opposite forces acting along the same line of action as shown here. And if those two forces are acting away from one another, then they are trying to stretch the member and uh, we call that tension. Similar to the tension in a cable where the uh, tension is trying to stretch the cable. In compression, the equal and opposite forces acting along the same line of action act towards one another resulting in those forces uh, trying to uh, squeeze or compress uh, the member. We'll be using two different methods to solve for the forces present in simple truss members, namely the method of joints, which I'll be discussing in this lecture, and the method of sections, which I'll be discussing in the next lecture. In the method of joints, we'll be considering the equilibrium of individual joints in the truss. And we'll be drawing free body diagrams of individual joints. And we need to make sure, as we've learned earlier uh, in the course with uh, our work with free body diagrams, that we include all of the forces uh, acting at the joint when we're uh, drawing the free body diagram. This includes any external forces, which if our trusses would be loads applied to the truss at that joint, and can include support reactions where that joint uh, is connected to ground. And, and then as well as the forces um, acting on the joint from the truss members themselves. So these, we'll be working with these free body diagrams will be uh, 2D particle equilibrium free body diagrams, as we'll see, and which means we have these two equations of equilibrium to write and uh, use to solve for the unknown forces acting at the joints in the simple truss. So let's look at an example of a free body diagram of a joint in a simple truss. We have a simple truss here in the figure and we'll draw a free body diagram of the of joint B. So Imagine that I remove the pin connecting the two force members, uh, the two uh, truss members, and that the 500 Newton uh, force is applied to. And I then show, uh, proceed to draw a free body diagram of that pin, which I'm going to model as a particle in 2D. So I would show the 500 Newton force, of course which is applied directly to the pin. And then for member AB, I would show a force acting in the vertical uh, downward direction. And for FBC, I would show a force acting along 
member FBC. You remember all the trust members are two force members, so the force, the, the forces um, um, acting at the joint will be in the along the line of action of the uh, specific trust member. So for FBC, uh, we know that it acts at a 45 degree angle. So we just have the one unknown there of uh, the magnitude of FBC. And similar for FBA, we know it acts vertically downward. Um, so we know its direction, but we don't know its magnitude. So for this free body diagram, we have two unknowns and we have two equations that we can use. So we should be able to solve for uh, both F, the magnitude of FBA and the magnitude of FBC uh, here where we are uh, going to take this any further. Here are the steps for analyzing a simple truss using the method of joints. The first thing you'll need to do is to determine the trusses support reactions and you can accomplish this by drawing a free body diagram of the entire truss and applying the three equations of equilibrium that will be available to you in this 2D rigid body equilibrium situation. Next, you will need to pick a starting joint, um, hopefully one that has only one or two unknowns. And when you draw the free body diagram of a joint, it's good practice to assume that all unknown member forces act in tension. In other words, they're, they're pulling on the pin that you're drawing the free body diagram of unless you can determine by inspection that the forces are actually compression loads. Next, you're going to apply the two equations of equilibrium that you have available to you. Some of the forces in the X direction equal zero, some of the forces in the Y direction equal zero to determine the unknown or unknowns in that free body diagram. If the answer for an unknown is positive, then the direction you assumed is correct. Otherwise, it is in the opposite direction. And again, like I mentioned on a previous slide, a good practice is to assume that uh, an unknown force is always acting in tension. Um, so then if you get a negative answer, you know it's in compression. Um, that's up to you how you want to approach this, but this is another um, uh, situation where uh, the minus signs can get a little tricky and confusing uh, if you don't pick a, uh, a, a practice to go with and, and stick to it. After you finish with that first joint, then you're going to repeat the second and third steps at each, at each joint in the truss until all the required forces are determined. In other words, if they told you, if the question said, um, determine the force in each of the members of the truss and whether each member is in tension or compression, you have to go all the way around the different joints until you solve for all of those uh, forces that they've asked you for. Being able to identify zero force members can greatly simplify your simple truss analysis. There are two cases where zero force members exist. The first case is where you have a joint that has only two non-collinear members and there is no external load or support reaction at the joint at the joint. If that's the case, then those two members are zero force members. Let's look at an example. Let's look at this truss and the two members connected at joint D. 
So I look at joint D and I say, okay, there are only two members coming into this, into D, and those members are not collinear. So that meets the definition that I just, uh, we just discussed. So therefore, ED and CD are in neither tension or compression. They exert no force on D, the pin at D, or the pin at E, or the pin at C, and we can just discard them. We can just take them out of the problem. Notice we have a similar situation at A. We have only two members coming into A, FA and BA. So this situation also meets the definition here in the first bullet. So we can disregard FA and AB. And you can prove this pretty easily if you write the equations of equilibrium at those joints and um, solve for the unknowns. You'll see that uh, the force in the members has to be zero. And as we did in the original figure there, you can remove zero force members when analyzing the truss. So again, we could just redraw the truss without those members. The second case where we will have a zero force member is where we have three members forming a truss joint for which two of the members are, are collinear and there is no external load or reaction at the joint. If that's the case, then that third non-collinear member is a zero force member. So let's look at the truss here on the right. We have a joint with three members at D. Two members are collinear, DE and DC. The third member is not collinear with those two and there's no external load or reaction at D. So therefore, DA is a zero force member and we can take it out of the problem. Similar situation at C, two collinear members coming into C, a third non-collinear member at that joint and no external load or reaction. So CA can go out and it looks a little better here. You can redraw that truss with just the three members. Greatly simplifies things. Now note that zero force members are not useless in the, in the real world. They're used to increase stability and rigidity of the truss as well as to provide support for various different loading conditions. So it's not like they don't have to be there in the real world, but for our analysis uh, of a simple truss, we're, we can ignore them.